reflected on my reading. You can see a picture of me there reading my book in front of a dragon. The dragon's not really in my house, but um, but I I like sort of sometimes when I read, I like to I like to actually read out loud and um, to pretend that there are other people in the room that that I'm reading to. But I've spent a long, long time being a librarian in lots of different schools, including lots of international schools as well. And um, I think that um, reading is just, if you can read, if you like reading, if you can get to the habit of reading, then you can do anything really. It really empowers you to do lots and lots of stuff. So we're going to look today about how when we do reading, we read to an extent with a purpose so that we know that what we read, we can start building our own values and how we approach life based on the things that we discover through our adventures in reading. So because I'm, I'm not very good with teams, I'm going to have some help actually in in changing my slides so I'm going to get to the first slide now we'll have a little look at that has it moved is it, it moving it has it's certainly moved for me um when when ah. give me a thumbs up if it's moved yes it's moved Sarah OK, so I'm going to have to do it simultaneously, I think, with you. So I wanted to I wanted to start by thinking about what are we talking about? I mean, what is reading when we do it? Does anybody have any ideas? Do you want to you know, give me some uh, some ideas on what, what do you think reading is? OK. Yeah, we I think reading is um a hobby which you can get really used to and then it just takes you into a new world full of um everything and yeah. i really love reading because it it takes your free time and it, it like um it really you can spend your time wisely by also reading because it teaches you loads of stuff so yeah yeah Thank you, women. That's a really good answer. I think reading can be whatever you want it to be and how it fits into your life. And I don't know if some of you have this um, thing. Oh, Anya wants to say something. Shall I ask Anya? What would you like to say, Anya? Also, um, to add to Win Win's great description, um, reading can take us places that we would probably never get to go to in real life. Yeah, that's very true, isn't it? Yeah. And do you find sometimes, you know, with reading, sometimes you get so absorbed in a story or a book that time seems to flash by and you suddenly look up and you realise two or three hours have gone past. And that's something which they call a state of flow. So that's that's a, a science phenomenon that's called state of flow. And really, when you're learning stuff in school, if you can get to that same stuff, if you can get to that same state of flow in everything you learn, then you absorb it much better. You remember all the facts and things. So I'm going to get um, Mrs. Trafford to press another button and we're going to have a little look at a picture here. Not see her anymore. Have you, have yes, you done, uh, just, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't see yeah. it. That's the uh, we That's we okay. have a picture of um, a hand with circles and symbols around oh. a screen. No. It's, it, have you got one with lots of different things under the heading? What are we talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's got lots of circles of news and things like that yes. on it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's good. That's all. So this really was this picture. I want to put it up there because it's about the fact that these days lots of people think reading is just opening a book and reading a book, maybe a book, a storybook. But, you know, anywhere where we get writing and things like that, it's it, it's reading where, wherever you go. And it might even be as you're kind of driving around somewhere or going on a walk somewhere. You know, we see signs all over the place and we've got to be able to read them. So if you can imagine what it would be like, maybe if, you know, you couldn't see very well, it would be really difficult, wouldn't it, if you had to live in a world where you couldn't read. And it would be quite dangerous because you wouldn't see danger signs and things like that anymore 
it'd be really difficult um, to find your way from one place to another place because you've got to be able to read the directions and things like that that you're going to take. And everything really that we do in life depends on reading. But it wasn't always the case because um, before about 1400, um, most people couldn't read. They just sort of talked to each other and, and, you know, drew pictures and things like that. And then in 1436, something very special happened. Does anybody know what happened in 1436? What was invented? Any ideas? It's to do with reading. Yeah, win win. Do you think? Sorry, is it um, newspapers? It's a sort of newspapers because they were able to do it because of this invention. Newspapers were able to be, and the missing word is. Is it printing? Uh, oh. Sorry? Is it printing? It is printing. There was a man called Johannes Gutenberg, and in 1436, he invented the printing press. And that's when suddenly people, ordinary people, could start reading books. Before that, they didn't really do that. It was only um, sort of religious people who copied out these books by longhand. But the printing press meant that everybody could read. And that made a huge, huge difference. And I'm going to get an, another click on the slide so that we can see the next, the next picture. You'll have to tell me if it's if you can see it. It's, like, it's oh. there. It's there. Reading it's there. in numbers. Right, that's the one. So this is, shows you, this slide shows you how people are kind of reading around the world. This is the sorts of things that people read, some statistics. And you can see that some people are reading audiobooks while well, they're listening to audiobooks. Does that count as reading? We don't know. Um, it's still telling you the stories. And then there's reading digital books online. There's, and then you can see that why people read as well. And, you know, over half the people are reading because they need it for work or for school. And I think that's important because if we didn't read, we wouldn't be able to participate properly in lessons and, in, and later on when we go to work and so on. So let's have another click on the slide, see what happens next. There we are. Yeah, OK. And now we've got different types of reader. Now, what I'd love for you to do is have a look at all these different types of reader. I wonder what kind of a reader you are. So there's lots of different ones. There's a person who likes to snuggle up under a blanket. There's the person who likes to read lots and lots of different books all at the same time. They just read one and they have another one. I know somebody once who had a different book in every room in their house and they just carry on reading that book whenever they got to it. Then there's also um, people who just like to um, have a, a drink or something while they're reading. The people who like to read perhaps upside down or on their backs or anywhere like that. There's the people, my husband does this, the people who kind of mutter the words as they're reading. He does that all the time on there. And then there's the people who've always got a book in their bag. And the one I really relate to is that one about the person who stays up all night reading. That's me. I used to do that as a, uh, as a child as well. I'd be up all night looking under the blankets and just, just reading with a torch and things like that. And the funny thing was that I didn't generally read storybooks. What I used to like to take to bed with me was a dictionary. What's that like? So I used to look at dictionary. I used to make little games up that I could play with dictionary words and things like that because I just, just loved the feel of the, and the sound of words. OK, let's have another click and see what happens next. Clicked. And I'm hoping you get something that says integrity. Right. So is there anybody out there who can tell me what they think integrity means? Yes, Flavia. Do you want to unmute Flavia? I don't think I can hear her. Um, who else did we have? There we go. Sorry. Oh, I can hear. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, I think integrity is putting all your 
sense of self in whatever it is you're doing, be it your, you know, your mind being present with what you're doing and putting your effort into it and putting your heart into it, if it's something that you can do that with, um, and really caring about the holistic process of whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, thank you, Flavia. That's a really good, um, a good description of it. It's kind of like really being your own person. And this, this slide here, you can see all the different things that feed into that idea of integrity. And we're going to click again because I just want to show you um, some quotes about it. So if, you, if we do another click, hopefully. Yes, we've clicked on. There. And we've got a couple of slides there. And the first one was by an author called C.S. Lewis. And he said that integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody is watching. So it's about your inner self having your own feelings about what is morally right and what's wrong. And integrity is being true to those values that you've built up. We're going to find out how reading can help you to develop integrity and to develop you into thinking in your own way and not being not following the crowd. The second quote is about um not choosing something just because maybe it's the quickest way to do it or the most convenient way to do it, but doing it that way because it's right. So if we combine the two things together, even if there's nobody that's going to pull us up on something, the important thing with integrity is to do what you think is the right path, what you think your values are. And this comes, I think, there's some very interesting philosophy around the world about this. So I'm going to get you to click again. And I'm going to introduce you to two people. So the first person that you can see actually on that slide there is um, a man called Friedrich Schiller. And he was a philosopher who um, wrote a book called On the Aesthetic Education of Man in 1795 and what he said was that you need to be your own person you need to develop your own philosophy you need to judge the world about what's right and what's wrong in your eyes and take into consideration everything that's around you now that was quite an interesting take on it and a lot of people believed in it and an interesting development came out of his beliefs, and that is a movement, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, called the Folk Schools, which were actually started in Denmark around the late 1700s. And what they said was that these were schools for the education of the people. So before it was only very rich people who could go to school. But in Denmark, they said, no, even the farm labourers, everybody should have a chance at education. And it was very much based upon Schiller and how he said that everybody's got to know enough to be able to have their own sense of belief, their own rationale for what's the right path or the wrong path. And the second picture that's on there is of a 19 year old girl called Matilda Fibiger. And she wrote a novel in 1851 when it was very difficult for women to actually have stories published. And it was called Clara Raphael, 12 Letters. Now, it was unusual because she was able to publish it under her own name. The story was actually about her. And one of the stories she told about it was about her friend. And she looked at her friend and she looked at the philosophy of her friend and what her friend thought. And it was at a time when Denmark was undergoing a revolution. And she said about her friend, my friend is passionate about all the little things. I care about the grand ones. I love all the soldiers as brothers because they fight the cause. But she is interested in the cause only because she knows and likes a couple of the soldiers. And that's the difference because the person with integrity looks at the bigger picture and is looking for the benefit of society rather than just for their own gain. So this is partly what it is and it goes back a long way this thought and this whole philosophy because it was developed in Denmark spread throughout Scandinavia 
And Greta Thunberg, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, um, with her campaigning about you know saving the world from um, imploding due to um, due to climate change, Greta Thunberg, of course, comes from a Nordic country, and she's almost certainly been influenced by this philosophy, which pervades through those northern schools. So it's quite interesting. There's a lot about it. You can read about it, the, the folk school movement. And it's quite interesting. If you're interested in integrity and where it comes from, there's a very strong message there. OK, let's do another slide. Let's click on. Yep. Yeah, we're done. OK, so now we've got a picture of a sheep reading a book. Yeah. Sheep don't really read books, I don't think. But this one does. But this is to say that, you know, when you are thinking about your reading, you need to interpret things in your own way. It's your journey. Even if everybody else says something and you think differently, that's fine to do that. If you can actually read something, get a different message out of it, and you can explain why you can get a different message out of it, then that that's okay. And it's all right to be your own person. You don't have to do things just because everybody else is. Am I going to click on to another slide fairly quickly here? And we've got a book which is called How to Be Cooler Than Cool. Yes. Now imagine this. Imagine that you've heard your friends talking about this book or something similar and you thought, well, I should know something about this, but I haven't read it. And then you think, hmm, well, maybe I can just pretend I've read it. So let's click again and see what happens. And we get a nice sort of robot there. So you think, oh, actually, I could go to the Internet and I could ask chat GPT or I could ask one of the other generative AI tools if they know anything about this book. And if so, could they tell me all about it? And then that way I don't really have to read it. But the problem with that is. And we'll click again. Zero integrity, not good. And why is it not good? Because suppose after that, one of your friends says to you something about one of the characters in that book that unfortunately weren't part of the GPT um, information you were given. So if we click again, we can see what happens to you. You end up as a sheep with a bucket on your head, feeling very silly because you've kind of thought you get away with it, but you don't really, do you? No. So let's try again. So let's pretend this time we'll click again. This time, let's pretend we've got an essay to write. Some work, teacher set, and you thought, oh, oh no, I haven't done it yet. In fact, I haven't even started. Oh, what am I going to do? There's a deadline coming up. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't hand in my homework, if I don't hand it in for the exam or something like that. Oh, no, it's going to be really bad. I've just got to get some mark somehow. So what am I going to do? Let's click again. We'll use ChatGPT again or something similar and we'll see if we can get it. So I'm just going to put my essay title in there and hopefully it will write something that I can copy and paste and hand in and pretend it's my work. That's not really the way to use generative AI. And I've spent a whole morning today with people from all around the world explaining to them how you can actually use AI properly without cheating and how it can be really beneficial and constructive for you. But that's another talk. So we'll have to see if we can do that. One. So here we are in our essay. We've used chat GPT. So let's click again and see what happens. And we get zero integrity again. Oh, yes. And the teacher says to you, oh, well, that was an interesting thought you had in that essay. Could you tell me more about it? But unfortunately, chat GPT didn't tell you the right information. It just gave you the answer and you didn't understand that answer. So if we click again, once more, we end up as a sheep with a bucket on our head. Not a good look. And the teacher won't be very happy. So. Integrity is about knowing to do the right thing. And if we, you know, I mean, everybody 
makes mistakes. Everybody runs up against difficulties. So it's a really good philosophy. If you don't understand something, if you're not sure about something, ask or have a chat with somebody else about it. Because to say to your friends, actually, no, I didn't read it. Tell me about it. That's a much more positive thing. With your essay, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm rubbish at time management and I ran out of time and I, I really need some help with this because I don't know where to start. And so being honest is part of integrity as well. But it's also showing where you got the information from, showing how your thoughts were influenced by what you read as well. So we're going to click again and move on. And we're going to talk a little bit about how integrity in reading is about independence. The more you read about something, the more you can start questioning what you're reading. And the more you know about something, the more you can start being critical of it. And reading gives you a really good base of knowledge so that you can say, well, I think this or I think that. And it's not just off the top of your head, but it's something that you've read about and that you, you know about. So that you can become your own person. And that's important for health as well, because the more you do, the, the satisfaction you get. I'm sure you've all been there where you've worked really hard on a project or a piece of work. And when you finish it, you feel really great that you've achieved something. And, and that's important. So here we've got the sheep again. I've had a sort of sheep theme on this. And this is where Nigel the sheep is sort of saying, no, no, look, I've noticed that the man and the dog are working together. And all the other sheep are saying, oh, no, it's just conspiracy theory. But he knows something. He's he's actually observed something. So sometimes it's brave to put your head above um, the pulpit and actually um, to say what you're thinking. and. Be prepared to have critical thoughts thrown back at you, but it's a good idea to, to get your opinions across. So Sarah, can I do a quick check with you on um, what slide you're on? Just, uh, just oh, right. I'm on now uh, seven. Number, number seven. seven. Perfect. And Perfect. you should have a picture of a, a, hair, a man with a lot of hair. And yes. data is not information. Yes. So this is a man who is an astronomer and he's called Clifford Stoll. And he says something which I really like this thing. He says that if you get some data, that's not information because it's just facts and figures. It's not telling you anything. And even if you have some information about it, you can read the information, but you don't really know it. And even if you learn it and you know it, you might not really understand it. And finally, he says that just because you understand one thing about it, it's not wisdom. It's not actually being able to experiment with that knowledge and pass it on to others. So when we're reading a story or whether we're reading a piece of academic work, it's really important that we get beyond the information side, but we start looking at knowledge and developing into understanding and developing into wisdom where we can tell other people about what we've read and to know that we can back it up if they ask us questions about it. So this is all a part of developing your reading so that it, it's actually got integrity, that you know what it's about. And it doesn't matter whether it's a storybook or whether it's an information book, it's all, all the same. So we're going to move on to slide number eight now. And there should be a picture of a person reading a book with a head, with a brain inside it. Yes. Yeah, we're there. OK. So in this book, it's sort of, it, this is kind of telling us that in this picture that what reading can do for our brain, because reading really does start to have an impact on the brain. When we when we read, it's not just sort of like a load of stories and words going in that we decode and then it comes out again. But it really has an effect on the brain's reward system and it can make us feel good. As we said before, it can get us lost in the story and things like that. And it actually does to make our brain do a bit of work because our brain actually when we're reading about a story 
Our brain can't tell that we're not really in that story plot. It thinks we're there. So it actually starts acting as if we were really in that situation. So if we read a scary story, you might find you're getting butterflies in your stomach or sweaty palms as if you were really in that situation. If you're in a romantic story, then you, you, know, you feel all gooey and, and lovely and everything else. And, <laughs> and if you're reading a piece of academic work, you know, and it's talking about somebody doing an experiment, the brain thinks that you're actually doing that experiment or reading that um, academic novel or something like that. So it's very clever. We're going to make another click. And this time we will see a lovely picture of um, a chemical called dopamine. Now, I know quite a lot about dopamine because when I was at university, I studied biochemistry, despite being a librarian. I'm actually a scientist in disguise. So, um, but dopamine is what we call the feel-good hormone. So every time you do something and you get that rush of happiness or you feel good about yourself, it's because dopamine has surged into your brain and is making you feel happy. And it's sometimes called the reward so dopamine rewards you get for when you do something good. And if you do something with integrity, then you get a dopamine reward from your brain and it makes you feel good. So if we feel good and we feel positive, then that actually helps us to achieve the academic success that we're making, that we're, we're striving for as well. So reading has been shown that it really can enhance our dopamine levels because you can get lost in a book and um, it doesn't matter what you're reading, it will actually help your brain to think, oh, this is good, we'll have some more of this. So let's click again. And we've got, you should see three little pay, pay, pictures there. Can we see that? Yeah, I've got a thumbs yeah. up. Thank you, women. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> um, so the first picture is about reading with empathy. And what this means is that when you read, you can put yourself in the other person's shoes. Your brain helps you to do that. As you read, it thinks that you're becoming that other person. And so you kind of start getting their take on life, what they think. The middle one is about emotional intelligence. So what that means is that you could actually go into the reading and you could um, start relating um, to um, somebody's situation and thinking about, well, how would I react if I was in that situation? Was that Leila, did you have your hand up? Did you want to say something? I think I had a hand up there. Maybe not. Okay. So, up from a while ago. Okay. So, um, so the, the the main thing is that with emotional intelligence is that you know sometimes it's really hard to imagine what somebody's going through. So we can read with empathy and feel sorry for what they're going through, but when you read with emotional intelligence, we're actually experiencing what that person is feeling like. Actually, and thinking that we are that person and how would we deal with it? Would we deal with it differently to in the story or in the text if we're reading a piece of academic work? And then we can also use reading, which um, comes into um, that it comes into our thinking skills and our writing. So the reading is all interlinked because we can start asking questions about what we're reading. The more we immerse in it, the more we start thinking, well, I'd like to know about that. I'd like to know about that. I can't keep count of the number of times I've read books and thought, oh, I wish I knew what happened after the ending. You know, I want, I want another book, a sequel on that. And, it, you know, that it really is annoying when it suddenly finishes and you, you know, can't do it. Win -win, did you want to say something? When I was reading uh, this book, um, so Hercule um, Poirot just discovered that there's a murderer on the loose. And then I oh. just want to know who's the murderer so much that I tried to flip at the end of the book, but I didn't get any answer. Yeah, no, the answer. Do you know what, Win Win? That's what I do with reading. I'm terrible at reading sometimes. I read the first chapter, I read the last chapter, and I, I make can't it. Help it yeah. I just can't help myself. Yeah. I just can't help it. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. It's not good, though. It's not integrity. 
But do you know how I cured myself of doing that? I started reading books on my phone and it only gave you paragraphs at a time. And actually it's trained me to read more slowly and to take things in. So sometimes if you're, you're tempted to do that, that's a good way of stopping yourself from doing it on an iPad or something like that. So we're going to click again because I want to show you something now about reading perspectives. Now, here's a little exercise. I'm hoping this will work. So on here, you will see in the middle of this picture, there's a tiny little white dot in the centre. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there is a tiny little white dot. Where the greens and black thing is, there's a little white dot there. And what I'd like you to do is to just stare at that white dot for 30 seconds. Just stare at it, let your eyes relax and so on, and just stare at it. And we'll just do that for 30 seconds. Look straight on if you can. Just keep looking at it, concentrate on that white dot. And then I want you to shut your eyes and relax and see if you can see anything. Just close your eyes, relax. Does anybody see anything? Oh, there's a nodding going there from Anya. Right, who wants to tell me what they can see? Got lots of hands up there. <laughs> Does somebody want to unmute? Tell me what they see. Sophia, do you want to tell me? Anya? Anya, do you want to tell, tell us what you see? I see the Mona Lisa painting. Yeah. Did everybody else see that? It's so bright. When you do it properly, it comes out so bright like it's 3D. And this is really about how when we're reading sometimes, you can read something and be really interested in it. And then you go off and, I don't know, you have a, go to sleep for the evening and suddenly you wake up the next morning and you have a new idea or a new different way of seeing it. And this is what this kind of thing is doing. It's tricking your brain because it doesn't look like the Mona Lisa like when we just look at it straight off. But then it comes out and not just a, a picture, but a very vivid picture as well. So reading and reading images or reading text can actually have that powerful effect on our brain. And it helps us to see new and exciting ways of maybe turning the story around or if you're writing a piece of academic work, seeing a different angle on it. So think about the Mona Lisa. We're going to we're going to move on here. It's unconscious of time. Can we see what happens to your brain when we read? I'm going to get Mrs. Trafford to unmute. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I thought you were asking a, a, a question. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, we can see this one. And again, this is really asking about oh, we've got some hands up here. I've been terribly bad. I've got Philip. Do you do you want to say something? Oh, I can't see which page you're on. I'm, I'm on. I'm, all I can see is one. I can only see one particular page. I can't see what page you're on. Oh, OK. I, um, you know, um, you, I think I'm on page number five out of 16. That's the page. Oh, right. It, we're on number 11 at the moment. Oh. So is it is that is that what everybody's seeing? Now we saw the thing, so I don't know. Layla, it, I know you've been waiting for a while. Do you want to? Is Layla there? Just had her hand up. And when when? 
Sorry, but Layla's microphone is disabled, oh, so right. she can't turn on her microphone. Oh, OK, OK. So we've got a few others with hands up, I think. Don't know if Mrs. Trafford can see them all. Yep. Um, I'm just going to try and undisable Layla's um, mic. There we go. Right, Layla, you should be able to speak now. I'm still on page three. Oh. oh, I don't know why it's it's lagging behind for you. Perhaps when you watch, if you watch the video, you'll be able to see them at the same time. Yeah. Sorry about that, Leila. Anya, do you have a question? Anya's hand is up. No, it's gone back down. Um, Flavia? Um, some people might have clicked on one of the arrows on the slides on their screen and that makes them take control of what they can see. If a button that says to presenter comes up when you hover on the screen, click that and you'll see whatever's being presented by the teacher. Thank you, Flavia. Have we got anybody else who's... Anyone else? All right. Linia has her hand up. Yeah. Linia Bauer. No, nope, she's not <laughs> speaking. <laughs> you shy. Sorry. That's OK. We'll carry on, we're nearly, nearly, nearly through it then, and then, then we'll have lots of time for questions, hopefully, at the end. So um, I just wanted to show you, to take this forward again about um, what happens to your brain when you when you read. So um, we'll, what we'll do is, are we all on, should all be on slide 11 of 16, if you've got that on, if you're not there, click, click forward to um, slide 11. Um, one of the things I want to sh show you, so if we, we're going to do a, a click forward on this one, so one click forward, so we're on the next one, and it shows a picture of a brain you can see on there. Are you all seeing that? Do one click forward on it. There should be a picture of the reading brain. And that sort of shows... Yeah, can you see it? Um, yeah. Actually, I don't even see the button, because at first when I... Wait, oh, you put the sheet in the chat. Okay, I can see it in the chat. Yeah, we're we're on the right slide. Uh, okay. I the, chat. the the neuroscience the chat. reading. Okay. I, oh, but I can't. I don't. I oh, I see it is in the chat. I see it in the chat. All right. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. So here you can see on this picture that it shows you all the different things, different parts of the brain work on, and all of these, if you look at them, that things to do with reading aren't they they're all the different aspects of reading that it actually uh, undergoes so it lights up if you had a, a magic camera you could see every time you pick up a book all of these different areas would be activated and as I said before the brain can't tell the difference between whether you're really experiencing these things for real when you read or whether they're just something you're reading about so what it does is it does actions for you. So if we click again, I'll just show you this. And this is absolutely amazing. So if you were reading about somebody, I don't know, picking up a coffee cup, your muscles that are responsible for picking up the coffee cup, they wouldn't actually move. But as you were reading, those parts of your muscles would light up as if you were about to pick up a coffee cup. If you are reading about um, a wonderful meal with lots of different smells and things like that, then all your senses, your taste sense and your smell sense would all light up. They'd all be there. And so reading has this remarkable effect on it. And there's another really interesting sto um, uh, study that's been done. Now, one of the things it does is that if you're writing something, and you or if you're reading something and all it is is a description so let's imagine a hailstorm 
You might say the hailstorm covered the ground with bouncing white stones. That'd be a nice sentence and, and so on. But it's fairly just descriptive. It's, it's just descriptive. It's not telling you anything about it. But if you were to write a simile or to read a simile, which would be comparing one thing with another, you would say the hailstones clattered to the ground like marbles spilled from a box. And if you do that, if you read or write that, your brain reacts much more strongly to those emotive triggers. So it's, it's better from the point of view of reading and understanding. You could also write a metaphor, and that's when you take something which has got nothing to do with the thing you're talking about, but you link the two concepts together. So if you said an avalanche of hailstones fell from the sky, again, metaphor has the most impact of all in your brain. Because it's making the brain do a little bit of work. It's saying, well, this isn't straightforward. This is connecting two unconnectable things. So we have to make our brain work. We have to make our brain do exercise. And part of that means that when you do reading, you have to practice. So you can never read too much. You have to just keep doing it. It's like an athlete training for a marathon or something like that. The more we read, the easier it becomes, the more we can go on and read more and understand more. So let's click again and we're going to slide 12 and we're going to look at all these things that reading does. So it increases your vocabulary. It helps you put yourself in other people's shoes. It helps you when you're actually talking to somebody else to use better vocabulary or better ways to communicate what you want to get across. You can learn new things. It helps you with your writing and it helps you focus with your memory as well. You, it's all this stuff that's actually out there that you can learn about. So reading is, is really important. And the more we read, the more integrity we will have because we know more. So we can base our beliefs and values on um, using what we read. And if we move on, we'll click again. And we can see here that this triangle that reading does, it, it boosts our self-esteem. It gets that endorphin out and makes us want to feel good about what we're doing and wanting to finish. It gives us empathy so that we can understand new situations that perhaps we haven't um, experienced before. So perhaps if you're going to a new place, if you read about it first, it becomes far less sort of a worry or, you know, if you're scared, slightly scared about going, you can do that. Academic success. The more we read, the more we practice reading, the better it's been shown that people who read a lot have a, a greater percentage of grey cells. The little grey cells that if you've ever seen Agatha Christie and Porro, he was always talking about the little grey cells. And so you've got that, that um, foundation for academic success as well. We're going to click again and we can see we're back to the sheep again. Oh, well, the sheep, you know, it might graduate, it might get to the top of the of the pile academically, but it's not very likely. Far more likely if you're not a sheep and you become your own person and you try and strive for the best for you, but also taking into account what's best for society. Going to move on one again, um, more sheep. So what we're saying is don't be a sheep, don't just follow the crowd in your reading and things, but use your and just read because somebody's told you you've got to read. Read because you want to be creative and because you want to fly out there in the world and do amazing things in your life. So, you know, we need to use reading as a jumping off point, really, for our creativity. And we're going to move on one more, just one more to go. And we're going to say, so oh, we're going to say that we've got to remember in all of this talk, what I want you to take away really is that integrity that we're talking about is making good choices. Even when things get tough, don't cheat, don't don't skip over things, but train yourself to actually do what, what is right ethically. 
So it's not just taking shortcuts because we take shortcuts. Actually, we don't lo learn very much. Think of Clifford Stoll. We've got to understand, it. we've got to not just gain knowledge, but we've got to understand it and gain wisdom. Reading is going to help us um, with how our brain works and thinks. It's going to help us relate to other people and it's going to contribute towards getting good grades in the future and getting a good job. And it's just through reading, if we can cultivate it through reading, the more reading we do, it's going to be a lifelong skill. So what are you going to do? That's what I want to know. As a result of this, is there anything here that you thought, actually, I could maybe just change some things that I do at the moment? Anybody got any ideas what they might do? I was going to ask someone, we've... Oh, I know you read so many books. Would, would it, is, am I making you, you shy if I ask you? Or um, because I know you read lots. Claire, I know you read loads as well. Do, do any of you have any questions? Because we've got such an amazing expert here. <laughs> Leo, I know you read loads as well. I'm just looking down this list of attendees. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just wondering if I can get you all up on the screen. Ah, uh, Bo's put a question in the feed for you. Um, right. What's your favourite book and why? Oh, well. I've got two favourite books, really. Two really favourite books. I, I have to say that I'm I do like books where there's a sense of reality about them. So I'm going to tell you about two books. The first one that I think you probably have, have, have all read, which is Where the Wild Things Are. I just love that book. It's so, it's just so funny. And I can still remember back to when I was a child and going and stomping off to my room and trying to get away from all the horrible things that were going on around me because I'd been naughty and uh, and to think about um, an imaginary world and to get all my anger out of my system. So so I love that book. I can relate to that. But the other one that I really, really like, which is um, uh, more of a grown up book, really, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a very strange and very interesting book. And it's a book called The Heirloom Gang. So that's what A-I-R loom gang and what it's about it was in the um during the uh, the french revolution but there was a lot of problems in the english parliament at the time and it was because it was around the time when a lot of people were experimenting with the supernatural and ghosts and how thoughts you could train you could do some like um you could have a a, a thought and you could get somebody else you could project that thought on into somebody else's brain and this man thought that there was this magical machine under the Houses of Parliament that was operated by these people and they could influence the MPs who were speaking up in the chamber. And everybody thought he was mad. So they put him into a very famous prison called Bedlam, which was where all the mad people went in those days. But he carried on and he carried on drawing pictures about it and everything else. And then he escaped to France. And was sort of and was telling them all about it for things else. And they came over and they were sort of investigating it all. And one of the most interesting things was that he said that he could make somebody, he could influence the course of history by thought processing using this machine that didn't really exist. And he actually made a very prominent MP fall over and die in parliament and it actually changed how a particular bill went through and changed some of history because of it whether it was to do with this mystical machine we don't know but it's all documented and that's what i like about it, it was a story but it was based on fact and a very improbable story i've got a few hands up here layla i can see you Linnea's, Linnea's microphone thing is blocked. 
Sorry, say that again. I think it's been sorted. It's been sorted. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I sorted it for her. There's a few. Um, and um, I'm, I'm still on page three. Oh, oh no. No, no, no. no. Watch the video. You'll have to watch the video. We had a few other questions. Um, yes. Claire was asking, was there something that triggered your reading passion? Well, yeah, there was. And as I said, I was a bit of a strange child. I grew up in the countryside. And um, when you left, uh, finished school for the day, we weren't near any other people at all. So it was just me and my brother. And I didn't like my brother. So I, I kind of had to kind of occupy myself. So I used to invent little games for myself because I was always quite creative. And one of the games uh, I, well, I invented was a dictionary game. And what I used to do was I used to look up, a, look up a word in the dictionary just randomly. And then I would write down all the other words that related to it that the dictionary told me. And then I'd pick one of the words that it told me and I'd look that up and I'd write down more words. And I used to make like a spider's web of words, go all over the bits of paper and put little drawings on them and things like that. And I really think that kind of got my vocabulary really working. And um, I like looking at the different connections between words and how you could link them all together. And then my other uh, chief thing was that um, my grandfather actually edited the Children's Britannica many years ago. And I had a, was given a set for my birthday when I was about six or seven. And I used to take that to bed and read it. I just was just fascinated with it and was determined to find something that was wrong in it. So I looked it all up and I did, I found something. It was about a bird, a songbird, and they got the wrong name for it. So I wrote off to them and I said, do you realize this is wrong? <laughs> and they corrected it in the next edition. I think that kind of inspired me uh, to seduce. But I've, I've always been curious about things. And I think that's something you know, when we're younger, we always are exploring. We're always trying to find out about stuff. And I've somehow managed to keep that going. And if I read books or a storybook or something like that, I always want to know what's happened. I'm, I want to talk to the characters. And one of the things that I've really found in that respect helpful is... Um, if there are some AI tools, there is a, a wonderful AI tool called Pi. It's called Talk to Pi. And Pi is like a person. And you can go to Pi and you can ask it the most stupid question in the world and it will have an answer. But it doesn't tell you the answer. It just asks you another question and gets you to keep verifying what you've read. And it's it's very funny and it's it's been very accurate. And it really makes you think, am I thinking along the right line? Should I be thinking slightly differently? So talk to Pi, if you get away, it's free. And uh, and it, it's it's a really good AI tool for sorting out your thoughts and having conversations at a strange level. Okay. Have we Anybody got any got more them? questions? Oh, someone wants a link for Talk to Pi. Well, you talk might to have pie. to. Yeah, just literally right. put it in Talk to Pi and you'll find it. And it's. And it does respond with sort of like emojis and things like that as well. <laughs> Tia's, Tia's asking if you've got a favourite author. Have I got a favourite author? Well, yeah, I have. Um, she's an adult author, actually. She's called Annie Prue. And one of the reasons why I like her books is, and I think this is, again is bringing out the fact that I'm a bit of a scientist, really. She, there was the most amazing programme on television about how she researches her fiction books. And she literally will go and visit a place and spend two, three months in a place just so that she can get the words exactly right for one sentence in her book. 
and I just think that's incredible. And when you, she showed her house, and when you go in there and she's writing her books, she's got like mess all over the floor, lots and lots of different papers and artifacts and things she can use. And it all just inspires her and, and, and so on. If I was looking for a fiction author, who else but Matt Dickinson? Because he's done so many things in his life, <laughs> climbing up mountains and crossing deserts and Amazon forests. So, so I'd say go and read some of his books because they're again inspiring. And I think again he's somebody who actually writes according to what he's experienced, and and that's I think really important actually I, I like that some people like lots of fantasy but I'm I'm not really a fantasy reader I have to say although I do like John Wyndham <laughs> I'm just looking to see we've got one minute left um oh, another really interesting question what has been because we assume that librarians are very quiet people who, who don't, you know, do anything other than shuffle books. But what has been the most interesting and best thing about being a librarian? Oh, I think it's the fact that you can be creative because everybody else in a school has usually got somebody saying, well, you've got to get them ready to pass this exam or you've got to do this, or you've got to do that. But people leave, usually schools leave librarians alone and they say, go and do what you like. And of course, this isn't really very good for people like me because I'm not very good at being quiet and I'm not very good at doing lots of fiction reading. Really. <laughs> so whenever I was a librarian, I made sure that I had somebody who was my deputy who always kept me sensible. So, so they say, no, don't do that, Sarah, because that, that really isn't going to work. Come back to reality, because I sort of tend to jump in feet first and like to experiment. And if it doesn't work, I say, oh, well, that didn't work. I'll try something else instead. But I like sort of trying things out all the time. And that's what librarianship allows you to do. And you can do it in any subject you like. It's wonderful. And you meet so many interesting people and you meet lovely people in the schools, all the students, watching them growing up, watching how you've kind of given them things to inspire them to go on and do things in their life. And then they come back and tell you all about it. And you think, oh, that's nice. Flavia, do you want to ask your question out loud? Because it's a very good one. <laughs> um, have you ever written a book or thought about writing one? I've written quite a few books, <laughs> but they're mostly about how to be a school librarian. So, so my my latest one that I wrote during COVID is called Playing Games in the School Library. And that is, I got case studies from all around the world about how you can use game-based learning in, a, in, a, in school libraries and beyond. I've wrote a chapter in another one recently, which was about people going from school to university and how that because if you get the wrong impression of a librarian at school or a school counsellor, it's very difficult then to access those services when you get to university and to understand what they're really there for. And my latest one, which today has just come back from the proofreader, is um, about networking for librarians and it's all about all the different people in the wider school community that um, that we work with but I haven't written any children's books maybe I will <laughs> they're easy to write Sarah they're so easy <laughs> Anyway, it's half past five and um, I think we want to give you a very warm Cambridge Homeschool. Aww. Thank you. So interesting. Um, brilliant to see what's going on in our brains when we read. So lots of applause and love hearts and all sorts flying up Aww. on my screen. <laughs> Say thank oh, that's you very to kind. You. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Really interesting. And thank you for inviting me and thank you everybody for listening. That's been really good. It's been lovely to meet you all. And so many interesting questions. Fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and we will be diving into our library. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Go Excellent. forth and read. Read with integrity. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. And good night, everyone. Thank you for coming along. And um, we will see you for our next um, event in two weeks' time. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Night, night. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.